So we're still thinking about the features of heart failure, but I wanted to differentiate between acute and, and chronic because this sometimes causes a bit of confusion. So acute means of recent onset. So acute means it's of recent onset. It's just started. It's an acute heart failure. And we're first of all looking at acute left heart failure. Acute left heart failure. Now, very often here, there's a history of an acute cardiac event. So the times I've seen this most commonly is after myocardial infarction. So there's a myocardial infarction that occludes the blood supply to part of the left ventricle. Part of the left ventricle dies. So there's a dyskinetic or an akinetic segment in the left ventricle, basically a bit that's not contracting properly. And that's going to reduce the pumping efficiency of the heart. And of course, that's going to lead to dyspnea. Now, dyspnea means shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. DYS, dys, dys means difficulty. Pnea means to do with air or breathing. So like pnea is like a pneumatic tyre. That's where we get the word from. So dyspnea is difficulty breathing. And of course, this makes perfect sense because we know that <coughs> with a left ventricular failure, there we're going to get a damming back of blood to the lungs leading to pulmonary edema. And there can be acute dyspnea and it can develop into severe respiratory distress. And the dyspnea will be present even at rest if this is bad. And as well as that, you can get um, pink frothy sputum coming if it's a severe case of acute left heart failure. Because in the alveoli in the lungs, which are surrounded by lots of little blood vessels, very rich blood supply to the alveoli. The alveoli are basically surrounded in capillaries. But of course these capillaries need to drain into a branch of the pulmonary vein. And if the pulmonary vein is congested, there's going to be a back pressure of blood. That's going to increase the pressure of blood in the capillaries that surround the alveoli. And some of them will simply burst. And you'll get mixing of the blood with the mucus. So you'll get some blood going up to be coughed out <clears throat> from the respiratory tract. But because the mixing occurs low down, by the time the blood's coughed out and we see it, it's all very um, well mixed. So it makes the sputum look pink and it's frothy because it's mixed with air as well. So this pink frothy sputum. In what is severe uh, respiratory distress, these can be very distressed patients. And there's orthopnea. Now ortho actually means straight. So orthopedics originally meant straight children. It was just straightening children's bones. And we see the pinea part again, the, the breathing part. So the orthopnea is difficulty breathing lying down. So what happens here is the, when the patient's lying flat, the fluid goes all over the lung fields. So when the patient's lying down flat, when they're lying flat, The lying down flat, the pulmonary edema goes all over the lung fields and inhibits breathing altogether. But then when we sit the patient up, and the patient's in an upright position, like this, then what happens is the gravity effect means that the fluid accumulates mostly at the bottom of the lungs. Now that's bad for the bottom of the lungs, but of course what that does is it leaves the top of the lungs clear and the patient can breathe through the upper parts of the lungs. And that relieves the dyspnea. So that is uh, orthopnea. So orthopnea is shortness of breath when lying down, relieved by sitting up. And when the patients can't breathe, they're agitated, they're pale and clammy, 
and the pale and clammy because of the sympathetic activity. So sympathetic activity, activity of the sympathetic nervous system is going to cause peripheral vasoconstriction, making the patients appear pale. They will have what we call pallor. And the clamminess is caused by the stimulation of sweating. And the tachycardia is also a feature of the sympathetic attempted compensation. Occasionally there can be a, an inappropriate uh, bradycardia, which is a very poor prognostic uh, feature. Uh, the blood pressure will be raised, again due to sympathetic uh, activity. But of course the proviso here is, um, in severe cases, the patient will go into shock called cardiogenic shock. So shock is when the blood pressure is too low to perfuse the tissues of the body. Cardio is heart. And genic means genesis. That's where it began. So a shock that begins with the heart, a cardiogenic shock. There'll be uh, some increase in jugular venous pressure due to the backlog through to the systemic circulation. Uh, this is worse if the patient's fluid overloaded, if we've given them too much fluid. We've mentioned the pulmonary edema, really. And the pulmonary edema will cause uh, crepitations as well. And if you listen to the heart, auscultation, if there's valve failure, you'll, valvular failure, you'll hear a murmur. And uh, acute left heart failure is also associated with, with what's called a, a triple gallop rhythm of the heart. So that's an acute situation, and this can develop over oh, a very short period of time. Um, potentially, potentially, well, if it's very severe, instantly or potentially just minutes um, after a myocardial infarction, it can develop over an hour or so, quite rapidly, or uh, a very distressing, severe um, condition. So that's kind of uh, the f features of acute. And again, they do make sense in terms of our diagram that we hopefully know already now. Now, thinking now about chronic heart failure. Now, chronic just means the condition is established. The condition has been going on for a, lot, a while. So chronic is the converse of acute. It's the converse of acute. And very often in chronic heart failure, it's a bit relapsing and remitting. So the condition never goes away, but as the patient compensates, the features remit and then they'll have episodes such as intercurrent infection, which will, call, will, will cause a relapse and some decompensation where the patient becomes more, much, more, um, um, much more symptomatic. So, for example, if the patient has a, a myocardial infarction or the ischemia becomes worse or they develop a atrial fibrillation or they have a pulmonary embolism or um, anemia will make it worse by increasing the, the, um, the, the required workload of the heart because the patient's anemic and the blood has to be pumped around quicker. But then we have to be very careful in healthcare with patients with uh, controlled or compensated heart failure. For example, if we give them too much fluid, we can send them into failure. Um, if we, if we reduce their therapy, that can send them into failure. Or if, if we give negative inotropic drugs, such as too much beta blockers. Beta blockers have to be titrated very carefully in heart failure. Or there's other drugs, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or um, corticosteroids, that will encourage fluid overload. So these patients are kind of um, delicately compensated a lot of the time. We have to be careful not to decompensate them. Now thinking about left ventricular failure now in the more chronic patient, we know there's a, a reduced cardiac output. So there's reduced cardiac output from the left ventricle as we know. And that's going to lead to pulmonary edema as we've covered. So the low cardiac output is actually going to cause the crepitations because the low cardiac output means there's the damming back of blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins into the lungs.
the fatigue. Um, what happens here is the patients are very tired because blood is diverted to the essential organs to maintain the essential organs. So there's less blood available for perfusion of the, the muscles and the patients become very fatigued. And that's why they have weakness. And the low cardiac output causes general listlessness as well. These, these patients are quite uncomfortable and agitated sometimes. Of course, the left ventricle can't increase its workload significantly because it's diseased, it's failed. So they have extreme exercise intolerance. These patients are remarkably unfit and unable to increase their exercise tolerance. And again, th this idea of keeping the blood supply for the essential organs means that there's of often cold peripheries, cold hands and feet. And as the patients decompensate, the blood pressure is going to drop. And if the blood pressure drops, that means the kidneys are not going to be well perfused. And we can get oliguria. Olig means few. Urea means urine. So the volumes of urine are going to drop. And if the volumes of urine drop, then the water soluble urea is not adequately removed from the blood. And these patients are at risk of becoming uremic, increase in the amount of urea in the blood. So these, these are what we see commonly in hospital when we get patients admitted, especially in the uh, emergency department as they have one of these things like the MI, the ischemia, the infections, the AF, the anemia, or the iatro iatrogenic uh, inappropriate uh, management um, that leads to decompensation. And, and these features are exacerbated and, and made worse. Now, right ventricular failure, we should also think about, again, thinking more from the, the chronic situation. And here we have a high jugular venous pressure, JVP. So when the right ventricle is failing, the right ventricle is not ejecting the blood. The blood is damming back to the right atrium. That means the blood cannot drain adequately from the systemic veins. And of course the jugular veins are systemic veins, so they become congested, raised jugular venous pressure. Um, the liver, of course, is part of the body, so that becomes congested, hepatic congestion. And this is what pathologists call a, a meatloaf liver. The livers become very congested and look like meatloaf. And the peripheral edema is dependent. Now, dependent means it's affected by gravity. So there's going to be the backlog into the systemic circulation. That's going to increase the pressure in the systemic capillaries. That means the tissue fluid is not going to be adequately reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillaries. So remember that normally the tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure, that is the blood pressure, is greater than the osmotic pressure. And normally the tissue fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary because the osmotic pressure is greater than the now reduced hydrostatic pressure at the venous end of the capillary. But because the pressure is increased at the venous end of the capillary, the tissue fluid is not reabsorbed and we're left with the edema. If you want to go over that physiology, there is a, a series on capillaries on Campbell teaching where we do that in, in great detail. Also, we notice the ascites, which is the collection of fluid. Ascites really is just the edema, but in the peritoneal sac between the visceral and the parietal peritoneal membranes. You get this ascites and fluid in the abdominal cavity. And the back pressure can also lead to pleural effusions. Now the pleural effusions um, are more really associated with left heart failure, but we do see them in, um, we do see effusions into the pleural space in, in right heart failure as well, even though it's less common. So, um, Unwell patients raise GVP, JVP, eventually reduce liver function, swelling, swelling, um, difficulty breathing as well here. Now, the other thing that these patients sometimes get, um, 
And again, we do see this, the weight loss, it's sometimes called cardiac cachexia. Now, the cachexia is, is a term we usually use in association with cancer. Patients become cachexic when they have this appalling weight loss due to the release of inflammatory cytokines uh, in cancer. But we can also get cardiac cachexia. Cardiac, of course, means to do with the heart. So these patients can become emaciated and wasted. And this is because the congestion, because of course the, the gastrointestinal tract is part of the body, isn't it? It's part of the systemic circulation. So it's going to, there's going to be congestion here. And um, that can lead to anorexia. Anorexia means the patient doesn't feel hungry. Anorexia just means loss of appetite. And the congestion in the organs of the gastrointestinal tract can impair absorption of food from the gastrointestinal tract. So there's reduced absorption of nutrients into the blood because of the GI uh, congestion. And uh, the weight loss is also exacerbated by loss of skeletal muscle because muscle of course is much heavier than fat and there's loss of skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle atrophy as a result of the immobility. So useful to think about the chronic and the, the acute and the chronic uh, thinking about the compensated and decompensated heart failure. Trying to prevent decompensation episodes if we can with good management. Early recognition of infection, early recognition of anemia and correction of such uh, correctable uh, conditions. Uh, good management of other uh, ischemic heart disease problems. So thinking about not causing, preventing decompensations, certainly us not causing decompensations and correcting the underlying cause quickly when it occurs. But also thinking about the difference between the acute and the chronic. But also remembering, of course, all the time, as we've seen in the previous video in detail, that the left ventricular failure will lead to right ventricular failure, the right to the left. So the two tend to develop together in longer term conditions. But we do sometimes see this acute, so-called de novo presentation of, of, of the left ventricular failure with those features that, that we've considered. And of course, that is a medical emergency.